there are questions, then we can answer questions, and that's good. Cool. So um, I was working on a website recently, um, and uh, a couple error reports came in. So down from on high uh, came a couple things that you got to test for. So the sort of like um, description of what we had to test for came out something like this. So looks like we have to test rotation. And then uh, there was another one that came out like this. So let's see, uh, tap the Create New Account button. All right, so next thing we do is we sit down and uh, write up a script that looks something like this. I'll go into it later. And then uh, just sort of run that using Appium to simulate this iPad simulator. So that was rotation. Now click the Create Account button, go back, click the Create Account button, and go back. So boom, just as easy as that. We have someone who has a problem with the app. And then you go in, you write a test script, you reproduce their issues, and um, everything's good. So I don't actually work for healthcare.gov. Uh, I work for Sauce Labs. Um, we're a Selenium and Appium testing infrastructure as a service company. Um, but we also employ a couple developers who work on Appium which is an open source test framework for controlling mobile iOS and Android devices. So who here is familiar with Selenium? OK, that's pretty much everybody. So Selenium is to browsers what Appium is to mobile. Uh, they actually use the exact same protocol. So Selenium is driven on something called the JSON wire protocol. Uh, and Appium runs on something called the Mobile JSON Wire Protocol, which is just a superset of the original JSON Wire Protocol. This also means we guarantee that we'll always be a superset of Selenium, so that if um, if there's like a change in the Selenium spec, then we'll update the Appium Mobile JSON Wire spec to reflect that. Uh, what this means is that when you're using a test script with a test driver in order to control uh, a browser you can use the same exact uh, code and test script in order to test your mobile iOS Android devices. Um, but if you write a test using the Appium drivers, then you get a little bit of added functionality specific for mobile. Uh, all the Appium drivers are literally in the code just extending or including or inheriting from the original Selenium drivers for that. So you don't really have to worry about all of your code being completely different. And the only bugs you'll encounter are ones that already exist. <laughs> uh, so a little bit more about Appium um, as an open source project. It's about uh, coming on three years old now. Um, we had our major like 1.0 pretty stable release uh, uh, maybe like eight to nine months ago. Um, there's something like 200 contributors on GitHub. Um, most of the contribution comes from the Sauce Lab developers, but there's a couple other open source developers, and we encourage open source um, contributions from all of you. Um, it's still like a super active project. Uh, I'll talk more about that at the end. So. Um, the core parts of Appium that are sort of the core philosophy guiding us when building it are the following bullet points here. So node code changes. What this means is that what Appium is testing is the exact same app that you would upload to the App Store. You don't have to add any code to your project file for testing. It's going to be the same code. This also includes if you're using something like Ionic or Cordova, you don't really have to make any changes to the code of your app itself. The way we do this goes into the third bullet point here, which is to reuse the native automation libraries. Appium does not want, its goal is not to like build some brand new paradigm, a brand new way of how to test these things. What Appium really does under the hood is it's wrapping the native automation libraries that Apple and Google already provide for you to test your apps, except that the way we wrap it we allow you to communicate with those tests over HTTP using that JSON wire protocol. So you're sending commands to the phone. The phone responds by like moving the cursor, or tapping, or typing on something, or getting a screenshot, or getting the elements that are on the phone. 
you can, because it's an HTTP server, which is Appium, which is connected to devices, and your test script talks to it over HTTP, that takes us to our second bullet point, which is that you can write your tests using any framework or language. And the whole thing's open source. So if you don't have Appium, then your testing options, besides there are a couple other, um, there are a couple proprietary, like, um, mobile automation testing platforms. Uh, but the ones that come by default uh, for iOS is UI Automation from Apple, and from Android is UI Automator. And uh, has anyone used these um, in their native forms? OK, so um, they're both like very um, annoying to use for a couple different reasons. Um, as is the case between iOS and Android, they're always both bad, but for slightly different reasons. Uh, so on Android, uh, UI Automator is you sort of like bundle all of your tests into your actual Android package, which means it's in the same like it's in the same project file. So if you're using like Eclipse or IntelliJ or whatever, it's like Android Studio. It's like you add all your tests as a different like test class, and then it's actually um, kind of annoying to figure out how to like properly get the dependencies sorted out and then bundle those with the right sort of like manifest and then they like run on the emulator or on the app. Uh, iOS is even worse. Uh, UI automation, um, which is actually, I should amend to say that UI automation is now being deprecated by Apple and they're replacing it with XCUI test, um, except that uh, it doesn't quite work for some people yet, but it will. It seems like they're putting a lot of work into it, and they've hired a whole new team of uh, developers to work on that sort of thing. But the way UI automation works is you're inside Xcode, and instead of clicking the little play button to run your app, you hold down on the play button, and like this giant menu you never knew existed opened. And then you click like profile, and there's like 40 different options, and you choose automated test. And then it opens up another IDE, and inside of that is like a little tiny box where you can write your test, and except that you write it using JavaScript. But it's like a subset of JavaScript made by Apple, which has a weird API that allows you to control the phone. And you can only run this, again, through Xcode. Um, <laughs> so like you have to copy and paste your whole test into that little box and then run it. So um, annoying. But Appium um, does all this stuff for you and allows you just to write your tests uh, in your editor uh, and run them just through your command line, which means that you can run them easily on your CI systems for a continuous integration. It's really easy to put it into Jenkins, something like that. So a brief overview of just sort of like what can Appium do. So it works on iOS and Android. It works on native, hybrid, and mobile web, which means you can automate Chrome or Safari. Um, it can take screenshots. You view UI elements. You can type, tap, touch, all that stuff. You can rotate the device. You can toggle Wi-Fi and airplane mode. You can set the language and locale. You can push and pull files. You can lock and unlock the device and reset the app. Um, all these things will work on Android and iOS. Um, there's a few other things you can do. Sometimes it's a little bit platform specific, exactly what you can do. Like, it's way easier to put photos on the Android phone than it is on the iOS phone, because uh, they have to go into like photo library and stuff like that. But uh, all this stuff works for both. And use the one API for, of Appium, the driver, to do all this stuff. So usually, you don't have that many differences between your test for your, the iOS version of your app and the Android version of your app. Uh, and as I said before, you can like use whatever you want. So like be it TDD, BDD, you can use Mocha, JMO, Test, and G Cucumber. These aren't exhaustive lists. Basically, any any you know test framework. Uh, the languages here are what we currently support: JavaScript, Java, Ruby, Python, C Sharp, PHP. I think there's actually also a Perl driver. Um, and then you can click it into like Jenkins, Sauce Labs, Travis, CloudBees, like all these continuous integration, continuous deployment services can you know just call this stuff from the command line. All right, so quick demo. So here we have Xcode, um, and we've built a small little app here, which I'll just show you the app first. So okay, it's called MultiFetch Draw. It's just like a paint program. So I can like meow, meow, meow. But uh, the cool thing is that this is uh, a multi-touch draw program. So if you were to put two fingers down, um, which 
some of you might not know this, but you can do this like that. So that's two fingers, and you can like swirl around each other. OK. So let's automate that app really quick and draw ourselves a little picture. So down here, I'm going to start the Appium server from my command line. Uh, oh, it's already running over here. And here I'm going to run my test script. Here comes the simulator. And then put down three fingers and just twist like you're a robot. And then you can put down another three fingers and like, and it's the Appium logo. Ta da! Oh, uh, no, it's all programmatic. Yeah. That would be like, um, I wouldn't be able to do it that accurately yeah. with my fingers. Uh, I suppose I could have taken like a phone and then built myself like a jig with like three little touch capacitive rubber pads and like a crank. And it's like, crank, 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 but nah. <laughs> all right, cool. So that's just like. A demonstration of, yes, you can do actual touch actions with pretty much any arbitrary gesture of any sort, even things that humans can't even do. All right, so this is um, actually pretty nice. Uh, this is a JavaScript conference. I've talked about Appium before, but it's always at like a conference for you know nothing specific to language. So this is pretty great because I'm going to be able to walk you through all the specifics of writing um, Appium tests. And we can do this all in JavaScript. Uh, which makes it way easier. Uh, one of the hard parts of sort of teaching about Appium is that because you can do it in any language, everyone always wants to know how to do it in their language. And uh, the languages are all like a little bit different. Um, the reason for that is it's just a HTTP protocol that sends little JSON packets to control Appium. So each of the drivers, rather than being like one set, this is how you test Appium, each of them sort of takes on the flavor of their own language, which we encourage. So um, most important thing is to familiarize yourself with what are the options available for you for testing. So what I've linked here, and uh, I'll be um, uploading this code to the Midwest JS um, GitHub repo, is we have links here to the Selenium JSON Wire protocol and also the mobile JSON Wire protocol. And if you just look through those, it's you know if you look through the giant list of like API endpoints available, um, that'll really just help you see like oh okay I see how this works. And then the the drivers themselves when you're looking them up or you're like going in Stack Overflow how do I do this? Even if you find like uh, an example in a language you're not familiar with, it's still going to be something like oh okay I will obviously it touches these endpoints. And then, so the first thing is know the protocol. You don't have to memorize it. Just be familiar with what's available. And then know your specific driver. And so what I've linked here um, are the docs for the wd.js driver. Uh, WD stands for web driver. Um, and this, this one specific doc here shows all the API endpoints and the methods that they map up to, which is like super useful because you can just be like, oh, how do I? And you just sort of type in something, and it'll show you that. So when it comes also to JavaScript specifically, you have a couple options for drivers to use. So Selenium has WebDriverJS, um, which I suggest you not use. Uh, and then um, there's another open source one called WD.js, which we'll be using today. Uh, it's what we use on Appium to test Appium. Uh, it's what we use at Sauce Labs by default. And um, this is fully fleshed out with all the latest features from Appium. And also, since we contribute to it, whenever there's a change in Appium, that'll be the first driver that gets uh, a new like beta feature. Uh, there's also WebDriver IO, which is um, a super great driver. Uh, I think its source is a little bit simpler than WDJS. It handles WDJS was started before um, before promises came to Vogue, so it has promises, but it's a little bit clunky with them. Whereas WebDriver IO is much nicer with its promise flow. It's abstracted a few testing concepts a little bit better, and it has most of the Appium features as well. So WebDriver is pretty cool, um, but we're going to be looking uh, at WDJS here. 
So the first important thing with setting up one of these tests is it's the same as Selenium, where you have to instantiate, you start your test by first sending a packet of desired capabilities. This tells the server what you want to test on. So in this case, when you first send it, you say platform name is iOS or Android. Platform version, this is the version of the device you're running on. So for iOS, it'd be like 8.1, 8.4, 7.1. For Android, you've got like 5.0, 5.1, 4.4. Device name, um, you can give it iPhone 6. Uh, if I gave it like iPad, if I just use the simulator names that uh, Apple already has on the computer, then it'll start up that specific simulator. Um, Android emulator, right now it just runs uh, default Android emulator. Um, and then app, and you give it a path to your app. This path can either be a path to locally, so the path has to be a path to local to the machine running the, the Appium server. So if you're hitting a different Appium server on a different machine, it's not path local to your environment, it's path local to that. So you need to upload your app to the test server and then give it that location. Or you can pass in a URL here, and the server will automatically download that from wherever. And um, if it's zipped, it'll unzip it. And so that's usually a better way of doing things. Um, on, yeah. Also, there's a lot of other desired capabilities that you can pass in. If you just go to the Appium's docs, so on GitHub, it's github.com slash Appium slash Appium. Um, there's some nice docs there. The most useful one is caps.md which is all the desired capabilities available for all the platforms. There's some platform-specific ones. It lets you do a lot of things like controlling timeouts, like um, you can pass in a specific UDID of the device you want to automate, which is very useful. Um, this will work on real devices and emulators and simulators that way. Um, lots of stuff like that. You can also give it a, a, a couple parameters for how it should treat your tests, like by default. It completely resets the phone and like reinstalls the app on every test, which ensures you know that you have uh, the same environment every time you run your test. But if you're starting to get uh, annoyed and you want things to run faster, then you can tell it you know like, all right, well you know just you know keep the app on there and just you know run the tests every time, and it's more up to you to save your state, but you can run your apps uh, your tests faster. So I'm just going to go over a couple basic a uh, couple basic functions on that driver object that you create using WDJS. And then I'll show an example. Um, and then we can play around with stuff. And then afterwards, I have some more advanced stuff if we want to look at that. So when it comes to the basics, um, you've got this init function. This is the function that you pass your desired capabilities as an object. Um, I'm going through all the examples here are the callback versions of these functions. But if you start your driver, uh, when you create a new driver, you can tell it to be a promise driver. And then all of these functions are exactly the same, but they just don't, you don't pass them a callback, and um, they return promises that you know, their value gets injected into the promise. So but, um, for, so for these, though, so init takes your desired capabilities, and then in the, uh, you pass it a callback, and that callback receives, they're all node-style callbacks, so always error first. And then it receives the driver object that you then continue using. Um, Driver.source is super important. This is the main way to basically test really quickly, like, is my test even working? Did that init work? Um, did I get like to this part? And also, it allows you to better write your tests, because driver.source will return the source code of the current um, view that you're looking at on the device. Uh, when I say source code, this, is, this can mean different things. Um, originally, you know, this was part of the Selenium protocol, so source would return literally the page source of what you're viewing. Um, on Appium, if your driver is currently in the context of a web view in your app, you'll still get the page source, just HTML web view right there. If you're in the context of a native app, then source will return an XML file of what, uh, XML or XML string of the current like view hierarchy of what you're looking at. So on Android, this is the view hierarchy, and it returns like all these elements. And then on iOS, it's sort of the same thing, where it'll show your like sort of like this XML version of what's currently visible on the device. Um, things are a little bit wonky here between Android and iOS, where iOS will only show you what's currently visible on the screen, and Android will show you everything that 
exists on this view, um, whether or not it's visible. So if you have like, some things that scroll off, on iOS you won't see those, on Android you will. Uh, and this just has to do with how both automation libraries work. Um, but while looking at that source, you can sort of see the things that Appium is aware of. And that can help you write your test scripts in order to target those specific elements and interact with them later. Uh, we have save screenshot, which will just take a screenshot, save it to your wherever your test script's running. Uh, you can specify where you want that file to be put. And driver.quit, which you know just cleans up everything, tells Appium that your session's done. It you know shuts the simulator, shuts the emulator, um, and all that sort of jazz. So um, those are like the sort of basics on the driver. The next important thing is finding elements. So these function here, um, driver dot. You can see there's a pattern here. Driver dot element by and then accessibility ID, class name, XPath, Android UI automation, UI automator. So there's so accessibility ID is the best way of specifying finding elements for your tests. Uh, you can set this accessibility ID through iOS or Android, and it's you know what you would use if people are using like a screen reader or something like that. Um, the useful thing here is not only are your tests much harder when you add accessibility IDs to your elements, but also you um, inadvertently make your app more accessible to users. So uh, this is like double win. Um, you can also find elements by class name. Uh, and class name here would be like the sort of the class name of the element. So it's like UIA button on iOS or like Android.widget. Um, like button on Android. Um, you can find elements by XPath. Um, I don't suggest this, but um, it, it's there. Um, mm, yeah, uh, XPath, uh, for those who aren't familiar, is like basically a like defined, it's some spec for like how to specify where a single element is in uh, an XML document. Um, it's its own little DSL. Uh, it's kind of tricky, though. Like, you'll look at examples and you'll think you'll know how it works, but really, that's not how it works at all. So, like, stringently read the docs on that and expect uh, it's just a little funky. It's non-deterministic. Um, so then you can also we have these two other ones. So the top three are available in, Sel in Selenium always. The bottom two are added by Appium. We have Android UI Automation and UI Automator. And these, I would say, use very stringently unless you know exactly what you're doing. But they basically allow you to inject strings, which are then run in the native automation library of the automator itself. So by UI Automator on iOS, it allows you to literally inject JavaScript strings, which it'll just eval. So know what you're doing. <laughs> um, Android UI Automation allows you to access a couple a very, very small number of functions in the Java code that aren't available uh, directly through Appium. Um, if they were really useful to you, then Appium would provide them as a first class function. But if you really want to do something, you can pass in a string of Java code, and it'll get evaled somehow. Um, <laughs> Um, so then, and then the, the second list here is the plural versions of all those, right? So um, when you f search for a single element, it's going to either return that element or throw an error. If you search for a list of elements, it you know re returns an array or it returns an empty array if you didn't find them. So that's a little thing to watch out for. There is um, you know the the single ones will throw an error if not found, whereas the multiple ones will just give you an empty array. Um, <coughs> So here are, once you have that element object, here's what you can do with it. You can click it. You can send text to it. Keys will like actually type keys into it. Clear, clear is like a text field. Get attribute allows you to get a couple attributes, like is it visible. Um, get location, which will tell you exactly where in the screen it is. This one's the most useful for setting up your touch gestures, because what you can do is you can like get the location of maybe some sort of widget. And then you can set up a touch gesture, which like taps on that location and then like drags it to a different location. Um, you can get the size of the element, sort of same deal there. Um, also, all these things here are good for like testing, right? So you're like, okay, is the element you know as big as half the screen? Um, is the location of the login button at the top? Like things like this. Um, and the last one here, elements by accessibility ID. And you can surmise, of course, by UI automation, by XPath, by class name. So you can search for elements within elements. So you don't always have to be like, you know, setting up some giant selector at the top every time. You can sort of dial in. Um, 
one thing to watch out for, which is another common thing run into with the whole way this sort of system works, is when you have this element, you don't really have that element. Because these native automation libraries don't give you access to an actual like first class object in the UI of your like native app. Like you don't really have that text view. You just like have something that represents that text view when you looked for it. So if you like let's say get your login button and then you scroll down so it's no longer visible and then try to tap it, it, it's not going to be able to tap it because it's not there. So the way all these tests have to be written is you always want to sort of get something right before um, you know, you're actually tapping on it. You want to make sure that those elements are still there. So usually when you're storing these, you can set up a couple things to get yourself ready for your test. But you don't want to like declare everything at the top and then like get them later. Just like that won't really work out. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Um, also, uh, let's say it moves, like they won't track with that. So if you like get the location, and then literally there's an animation that moves it just like lower, the location isn't going to update unless you get the location again, right? Um, because everything is just you know messages getting passed back and forth from the server. The good news is though that if let's say it's animated to be like bouncing like this, if you're pulling get location, you'll get a new location each time. So. Just remember that like, it's not like the attributes on the element are bound to the attributes of the element on the screen. You're just getting snapshots of it each time. There's, um, uh, yeah, I'll talk. There's a way to simplify all this with a nice abstraction uh, called the page object model, which uh, I'll talk about at the end. OK, so given that, um, let's set up a test. So, mm -mm. I have more screen real estate. Mm -hmm. So here, um, I've stubbed out um, a very simple test for, uh, we have this test app. Um, if you want to play, just get started really quickly with a couple apps yourself. Um, oh, let me start off actually more of how to install Appium itself. It's npm install Appium. Um, it sounds easy, and I guess that part is. Uh, but of course, it, you should look at the docs for how to really install the whole thing, because it depends on, for example, like you have to have your Android SDKs installed. You have to have a couple environment variables telling you where your Android SDKs are. On iOS, you have to like make sure that you authorize the simulator to be run, things like that. But um, you can look up those docs. But for the most part, it's npm install Appium, and that gives you that whole thing. The whole thing's written in Node. Um, so. Here is like uh, sample testing. Um, if you npm install sample apps, then it'll install like three Android apps and like four iOS apps on your machine. Um, if you don't have a Mac, it'll just skip the iOS apps. Um, this is just super useful for if you're testing just one app really quick. Um, the iOS apps get built on your machine when you npm install, so then it'll sign it with your developer certificate so you can run them. Um, so here, I just defined this sort of object here, which has a host name and a port. And this is telling WDJS how to connect to my Appium server. Can everyone read it? Yeah, OK, cool. Uh, I'm going to start the Appium server down here just by running Appium or no dot since I'm in the Appium directory. It tells me it's running on port 4723, which is the default and which I've put right up here. So now that's running and just sort of sitting there waiting for commands. Um, here I've got my desired capabilities, so platform name iOS, platform version 8.4, iPhone 6, um, and app is app, which I defined up here was the path to the test app in that sample apps repo. Uh, all my examples here are using iOS just because their simulators start way faster than Android emulators. Um, and here we have like the very simplest just sort of test setup here. So driver equals WD dot promise chain remote. Uh, oh, we don't really actually want that. We just wd.remote. Um, and I'm passing it in this right up here. And then doing driver.init, desired capabilities, and then drive.quit. 
And so let's just run that and see if my edit didn't mess it up. So so here's the uh, simple test. So node simple test. Now, I mean, it's just going to run this automation. It's not a test, right? So I could include Mocha and then like do an assertion that like getting the page source works. OK, there's starts up the simulator, opens up my app, and then immediately quits. Boom. All right, so now um, we can have some audience participation, just sort of like play around with, uh, maybe we can like write some quick tests. The other added benefit here is I'll show you how I usually write my tests. Um, it can be annoying sometimes, especially if you're in a QA department that doesn't, isn't, you know, right across the hall from your and your developers um, to know, like, hey, how do I access your crazy elements? Um, or if you're not the developer yourself, right? And also, I'm always trying to, you know, having to repro bugs from people off GitHub, and it's always like, sometimes people will be nice enough to give us an app to test on, but it's just like, how do I even access your elements, sort of thing. So you can use um, various inspectors. Uh, there's like the Android inspector, um, which allows you to sort of view all those elements. And you can sort of get the names, the accessibility IDs, or the paths that way. There do exist um, other open source projects that we don't directly support right now that are Appium like GUIs that'll run this command line server for you. Um, and then they sort of show you a video of the emulator. And then you can like click on it, and it'll like show you how to target that element. Um, but all those. Because, of course, it's an algorithmic way of finding those elements, it actually only gives you the XPath uh, selector for finding them. So, and it's also a like algorithmically generated XPath, so it's not necessarily like human readable all the time. So, what I suggest is um, using something called uh, Appium REPL, which uh, also on GitHub, it's like you can look at the code; it's like 30 lines of code, um, super simple. But uh, what it allows us to do um, is you choose your desired capabilities, which I've declared in a separate JSON file. So I'll just choose my test app there. And it's going to start up, uh, basically, it's going to run the same exact code that we saw here before, um, except that in the middle of it, right in this callback before quit, it's just going to call the native um, node REPL. And so now I have here, this is the app. And here I'm in a REPL. Uh, let's see. Can everyone see that OK? Or should I make it bigger? Mm-hmm. OK. Is that better? Wait, I'll, I'll fix the hmm. OK doc. So here I'm just like in the REPL. And, um, Appium will usually time out if you don't send it a command within like 90 seconds, because it just assumes that your test script has malfunctioned at that point. But I pass an additional desired capability saying don't time out for a million seconds. So we can like sit here and we can like sort of play with um, our app interactively. So I'm going to do like driver.source and pass in the callback console.log and hit enter there. It's like, boom, OK, well, there's the source. So there you go. Um, we can take a second to kind of look at our app here. It's super convenient. Um, you can type in like numbers, and then it'll add them. Yeah, that's pretty advanced. It's got like this slider. So, um, so why don't we like I don't know like try interacting with that a bit? Maybe let's well let's clear that text field since I've messed it up. So let's try looking for that. I'm just going to do driver dot mm, element mm, by mm, class name. Let's try that one. I'm going to pass it uh, UI a, what is it? Text. Is it text field? Text edit? Text button? I always forget. Is it text edit? Anybody know? No? No help? No. I'm going to pass it. Um, I've in, in the REPL itself, I have this handler function that's in the global scope. And uh, it's just like, all it does is it's really convenient here for these find element things, where it just takes whatever gets passed into it and then stores it into a global variable called current. And that way, I don't have to like keep writing all these like nested callbacks in, in the REPL. So 
Let's see if that finds it. Uh, okay, I couldn't find that. Mm, UAA text field. Let's try that. Oh, that got it. So current now contains that giant object. <laughs> and why don't we do a current dot clear and see if that works. Ah, cool. And um, how about the second one? So maybe I'll do like driver dot elements by class name. And oh, I got two there. So I can do current on the second one dot clear. And oh, nice. Oh, <coughs> I didn't pass it a callback, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and maybe we'll go back to, let's see, does current still have elements in it? Current.length. Oh, we've got two elements. All right, so maybe current zero dot text. Ooh. Like, hello, Midwest.js. That tests cooks. Let's give it a callback this time. Uh, oh, did I really, really? See, testing on the mind. Is it going to work? No. I may mess it up with that error I threw earlier. I'm going to restart. Oh, actually, I know what I did. It wasn't that at all. All right, driver dot elements by class name mm, UIA text field handler. Okay, and then current, which holds those. First one. So I think actually dot text just returns the current text, and I should be using set text here. Mm, nope, what do you do? Mm. Well, hmm, maybe I can do set value. Not even a function. Hmm. 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 Keys? Uh, that shouldn't work at all. Anyways. Hmm. Oh, maybe I hit a bug. Let's see if I can get the source. Anyways, the REPL, no, it's still running. The REPL's useful because it allows you to just keep like trying all these things like that. Because if you were like doing this more traditionally by like writing all that stuff in this text in you know in your file here and then continually running that, there's like the 20 seconds it take or whatever, 10, 5 seconds to start that simulator. And then let's say we were already in like the fifth step of our app, like on the fifth page, like way far out here. And then you know, you're like, oh, how do I get that element? Like, is it set text? Is it text? And like that stuff's not working. Then like you have to go through that whole thing each time to get to that state of your app to see whether your your test is even working. So this REPL makes it super easy because when something works here, like uh, element driver dot element by class name UIA button and then you can do current dot click and you're like oh well I didn't get the callback again you're like oh okay that worked we computed the sum it went to zero there and so then what you can do is you can take those exact commands you're like uh, how did I even do that again so you can like just copy this one and put that here and then you can copy um, like this one 
and then you put that there. But really now you have to add the callback stuff, so this gets um, error and element. And then here you have element.click. And let's see, we had, mm -hmm. right. So, and now, like, when, you know, now we can be like, all right, well, how's my whole thing going? So let's, let's quit this. And that just kills the simulator, stops the session. And then I'm like, well, this time, run that test. Oh, whoops. That, sh oh, boy. See that? It's just going to quit as soon as we start. This is why you see the promise version is nicer, because eventually, if each step of your uh, test is going in, honestly, like JavaScript is not the best language for writing tests in. Sorry, I love Node, but it's just tests are inherently synchronous, and so uh, I don't really know why you'd want to have things async. But yeah, it's the language I do. Um, let's see where we're going. Right, that one quit right away because of the callbacks. Boom. Okay, so hit the button super quick. Boom. Um, there we go. And just something kind of fancy, real quick. So starting with the REPL again. I can do driver dot, I think it's rotate. Is that a function? Yep. And then I can say landscape. What? That didn't work. Hmm. Did I spell landscape wrong? Anyways, I'm running off I'm running off master, so but I promise you it does work since we have a huge <laughs> test suite. So, um, yeah. A uh, couple more slides of more advanced stuff. Screen orientation. What would rotate have done? Do you want to try it? Oh, 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 it's an object screen orientation landscape. Yep, OK. So it makes sense why it failed. Um, this is a good time to say that we're currently working on um, uh, the next version of Appium, which is Appium 1.5. Um, Appium 1.5 is basically a complete rewrite um, because most of Appium is has sort of, you know, it started as sort of experiment and then turned into something that actually like hundreds or thousands of people are using in production for their tests. Um, but it's still like mostly when you know building a brand new sort of thing, you're not really sure. Like it's an open source project, and you're like, yeah, let's have put a callback here, put a callback there. So the code's gotten a bit messy. But um, the rewrite is now like we're going to be done in, with a beta and have a beta in like two weeks, just about. And the whole thing's written in ES 2015 plus with async await. And all of a sudden, all that callback stuff is just gone. All of our files are like a third the length. It's super beautiful. All the race conditions are like completely gone. Um, and also, it has validation of the commands you send in. So <laughs> rather than just throwing a really like terrible error, it gives you much nicer errors. Um, let's see. So some more advanced topics. There's these context methods here. Um, so these are for switching in and out of web views. If you were to start with your desired capabilities and pass in here, browser name Safari and not give it an app, then it would start Safari on the iPhone and automatically put you into the web view context of Safari. Um, how this works is so iOS doesn't actually let you test any app that isn't your own app. Uh, it has to be the developer build and signed by you. Um, so there's no way for you to actually test Safari. But we can launch Safari. And then we just connect to the Safari debugger. 
And then we forward all of your commands to a smaller Selenium driver inside of Appium that then controls that Safari uh, like web view using the Safari debugger. And so the only difference this means is that the driver can only be in one context at a time. If you on a page a view that has like 10 embedded web views, then your like view hierarchy in the XML will show you all your native elements and just 10 web views. And then what you have to do is you have to do driver.contexts, and it'll list out web view 1, web view 2, web view 3, web view 4. And then you do driver.context or set context, and you choose the name of that context. And it'll whoop, like pop the whole context and state of the driver into that web view. Now when you get source, you're going to get just the source of that web view as HTML. So you also don't have to worry about like conflicting elements with the same name and stuff like that um, there. So just make sure, though, that like this can trip up a lot of users because they'll be like, I don't see my button. It's like, well, the button's in a web view, so you have to switch context into that web view in order to get to it. Uh, and then they'll be like, well, now I can't see like you know my like buttons on the UI. And it's like, yeah, switch out of your context. Um, there's also these touch gestures that you saw me demo earlier. Um, there, this is like um, so. So this was a spec that's um, been designed uh, where for Selenium rather where you have these touch action objects. Um, so you create a new one by just instantiating it. And then you have a couple commands, um, and you chain these gestures. So you're like gesture.press, and you give it from and move to offset, and then dot .release. Um, you can press into press. You can pass an element, and it'll tap in the center of that element. Or you can pass an object x, y, and it'll tap in those exact pixel coordinates. Or you can put in an element and pixel coordinates, and then it will tap on that element at those coordinates offset from the upper left corner, right? And then move to sort of works the same way, but move to will do it with an offset. But if you give an element, it moves to that element. Same sort of deal there. And then you release. And so each gesture sort of is like one finger. Then you're like gesture.perform, and then it does the whole thing at once. So the important thing is you have to sort of compose the whole gesture before sending it as a command to the server. Because like it really the timing is pretty important for your like gesture like a flick or something. So you make sure you get the timing all right when you set it up. You can do this where it runs all these things immediately, but you can sort of give it an, an, uh, a wait time, and you can also tell move to how much to delay. So you can like be like move from here to there, but take two seconds doing it, and it'll be like. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can also put weights in here where you're like you know have the finger tap touch down here. Move down here, wait three seconds, move up to here, wait three seconds, move over here, that sort of thing. And then you send it all off with gesture.perform. When it comes to t multiple touch gestures, you just create multiple of these objects without performing them. And then you sort of chain them up and add them to this multi touch object. And they tell that to perform. And it, the way it works is it'll do the whole gesture um, step by step for all of them. So if you have like four steps, and they're both like touch down, move down, and then you know like move in and then touch up. Then it'll like sort of do those together. Um, but if let's say one of these had to wait 20 seconds and the other like had to wait one second, then um, it would start to like do this. But it still like sort of puts them together. It's kind of confusing. It's a weird spec, but um, uh, anything is technically possible. <laughs> Um, some general tips about testing, specifically timing is the most important. Appium will do all of your test steps as quickly as it possibly can. So that's like at computer speed, not at user speed. And remember that you're simulating users. Uh, this will hit a lot of people when they first start testing using Selenium and Appium because they'll be like, tap on this button and then type in here and then click this button. But really what's actually going on is when you like tap the first button, you know, maybe it takes like a second to load the UI elements that you want to tap on next. But you know, your your script is going as quickly as it can. And so your users are like, well, my users never complain about the button not being there. And it's like, well, yeah, but your users like aren't computed. It's like this stuff goes really quickly. And so most of the time you want to be like checking for the presence of an element before trying to interact with it. And for that, there's a lot of convenience functions added on to WDJS, and people have written their own libraries where you can sort of be like, wait for the presence of this element, and it'll do like a polling sort of thing while waiting for that. And then once it exists, then it'll tap on it. Um, be able to run tests singly, that's like super important. Make sure that each of your tests in your whole test suite can run like individually. 
That way they're useful to developers trying to fix something. Um, if like your test can only run in order, then it's kind of useless because you can't like replicate one test. Um, don't try to build your own DSL over testing. It's much nicer to just have functions for everything. Uh, build definitely build like convenience libraries for the people writing your tests, but don't like be like, well, the people writing the tests don't really understand development very well, so I'll just give them this like DSL that's like super easy to write tests with. But then they're always gonna like want to put in logic, and then like try to they'll always hack your DSL unless you give them like a Turing complete DSL, in which case you might as well just give them JavaScript. Um, there's also something called the page object model, which is pretty cool. This, it's this abstraction. Um, this, is, this exists in a lot of different um, testing uh, frameworks, not just Selenium and Appium. Um, and basically, though, it sort of has you set up where um, you, you have this third layer. You can almost imagine it like uh, an Excel spreadsheet that's a mapping from the elements that you expect to have in your views and the selectors used for actually finding those elements. And so what happens is my test script is just like click login button. And then your page object model knows to match login button with find element by class button, uh, you know, and then of those find the one with the text login, right? And that way when you have a developer change the UI slightly, like let's say like you were finding that element with just like it's the first, you know, div in like, you know, this login nav thing. And then they move it to like another div inside of that, and all of a sudden your selector might not work anymore. They can just update the page object model, and your tests don't have to be updated. And this is a really good abstraction for when you have a separate QA team, development team, that you can sort of be like, hey, here's all the things you need to interact with. And when we change them, we guarantee that we'll change their selectors. And you don't have to change your tests every time. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah. Um. Right, so the question is, how could you test a single, single, like one single page app on iOS and Android and mobile browsers, and also on actual browsers, right, with just a single test? So what you would do is you would have your test runner. So you'd, you'd write your test if it's the same single page app. So not like some websites will have like the mobile version where they detect that you're on you know, a mobile device and they'll like give you a completely different UI. Um, but assuming you have the same UI for all of them and it's you know, just dynamic in how it expands things, then all of your elements should have accessibility IDs attached to them. So as long as those elements have accessibility IDs, then you just change those desired capabilities where you say instead of an iOS, just choose Android. And the same test will run and it'll run exactly the same. It's expecting to find them. All the commands that are available here are the same for Android and iOS. I could, um, I could just switch the desired capabilities on that simple test we ran or in the Appium REPL, and it would have brought up the Android emulator. Um, if you want to test on a web browser, you can use the same exact test, but it has to be Selenium. Now, that just means I have a different server running. So I could have ran, I was running the Appium server on port 4723, I could run Selenium server on port 4724, and then I just changed the, um, the host or the, or the port number in that when you saw, uh, let's see, in our desired capabilities here. So right here, I set that there. So the way you set up your whole suite is I would actually set this, instead of port that, I would be like uh, process dot env.appium port, right? Or like, um, like currently, uh, maybe like test port. Or maybe I would take like process.args um, and give it like, you know, um, that. And so this could be a script where you pass into the script the host name and the port. Uh, and the same with your desired capabilities maybe all your desired capabilities could be stored in a separate JSON file. And then your test runner that kicks off the whole thing would be like, you know, um, let's say like you could use grunt for this very easily to just like, hey, run, like, here's a list of args. You know, it's just an array. And then args dot for each spawn a process that kicks this off. The nice thing there is you can, um, I have here sauce test. so. This here is the same exact test, but running on Sauce Labs, where I've set 
the host name to ondemand.saucelabs.com. I've given it port 80. And then I've set, um, this is my sauce username and my sauce access key. And all I did there was change that. Um, and I added the Appium version capability to tell Sauce Labs what version of Appium I want to run on, um, and told it no browser name. And then I switched my app, which before was local, to Sauce Storage testapp.zip. And Sauce Storage is another API that Sauce Labs has that allows you to upload your app, um, and that gets stored in their servers. And so once that's set up, now I could run um, all these tests with the different capabilities on Sauce Labs. And since I can run like maybe all like 20 or 30 of those tests, and Sauce Labs will run each test on a different VM. And so it'll run in parallel all at once. And so they'll all get done in about like a minute or two. So that's so if you're not using something like Sauce Labs, where they have all these environments set up, then you have to do a lot more work on your own CI servers to set up a Selenium server, set up an Appium server, and make sure that all those versions of Android, versions of iOS, and versions of uh, the web browsers are all available for you there. Answer your question? Cool. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does Appium support the latest, latest uh, beta versions of OSs? And uh, yes. So Android M, um, I believe, works last time somebody checked. Um, and of course, we want them to work right, because they have to come out right away. And uh, iOS 9 actually got released on Sauce Labs like yesterday. So you can actually test your Appium tests on iOS 9 right now in Sauce Labs. Um, yeah, we definitely try to keep up to date with that stuff. As I said, um, Apple is, has said that they basically are stopping supporting UI automation. Um, and so the one of the major reasons for our rewrite into um, uh, ES 2015 plus was so that the code is like much simpler and people can contribute much easier. Um, and that also makes it much easier for us to write just new drivers. And so we'll be working on an XCUI test driver that uses that new framework. Um, Apple hasn't, if you could um, file bugs with Apple asking them to uh, provide the feature that allows you to run those XCUI tests programmatically from the command line. I'd much appreciate it, since right now you can only run them through Xcode build, which requires the whole project file. And I'd rather have Apple just give us a command line tool for that rather than me having to reverse engineer Xcode. 